I wonder if there's just like a hundred Spider-Man characters on a board and they just close their eyes and threw that dart and it, oh, it landed on Madam Web. All right, we'll make a movie about her. Do your research, interns. Because I don't understand how you can make a comic book movie with no superheroes in it. Welcome to the Cinema Psycho Show, the madhouse for film freaks and film fans of all types. I'm your host, Brian Carrington, Jim Hello, co-host and filmmaker, John Woolscroft. Brian was with me in Pittsburgh researching Sony when at the box office this movie died. It's true. It's true. I was researching it. Yeah, we're, we're coming in hot in a movie that I, I did not really want to review at all. Right, John? Like, I didn't want to review this movie. I don't think yeah, you did either. Uh, I remember. I just, I think I did like a Facebook live out of like therapy needs when I, because I, I ironically saw it because it was, I heard it was one of those movies that's like not like so Morbius to me was just bad, bad. It was like boring, bad. But I heard that this one was an absolute dumpster fire that can't be missed if you like bad movies. And I have to say, I was thoroughly entertained but because of how awful it was but i needed to immediately go on like facebook live as therapy after i got out of the theater because i just i couldn't believe what i had just witnessed the movie of course being madame web dun 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 and all i can think is yeah like sony i know that you can't just use spider-man anymore but for the average consumer like me I grew up reading Spider-Man comics. He was on my Mount Rushmore of, of comics. Like I, I got every single Spider-Man comic I could. So I know who Morbius is. I know who Madam Web is. I know who Craven is. I, I think that one's been pushed back again. But the average person outside of Venom and the villains that you don't want to make a movie about because they're just villain villains. Like nobody knows who these people are. Nobody's going, oh boy, uh, finally an adaptation of Madam Web. I only knew about Madam Web because of the '90s Spider-Man uh, animated series. That that was that was for me my only exposure. Because I, I I don't go wrong. I, I like Spider-Man, but he's like he's not really on my Mount Rushmore because I'm a Batman person. Um, like yeah, as you know, um, you know, I I could go all the live long day on all the Batman villains and all the Batman side characters, and I know all of them because that's my fandom. Oh, but shut like, up, you DC shill. Fine. <laughs> fuck you. I don't care. Uh, but like for me, Madam Webb was always this old spinster who lived in this bizarro dimension and was just like a pain in Peter Parker's ass. Like she just showed up out of nowhere. Like, ha ha ha. Well, let's go do, help you do this. And ha ha ha. Let's go help you do that. And like she just seemed like the anti Obi-Wan Kenobi, if you will. <laughs> Yeah. She seemed kind of like an asshole. Like, like wish.com Obi-Wan yes, Kenobi. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's like, oh, she's trying to help him be better, a better Spider-Man. It's like, dude's already fucking Spider-Man. Like, I don't know how much more better you can make him. Um, I think there was one episode where she helped him when he turned into like man spider. I think that was one thing. But like I just I never I was like, okay, we're gonna and like I heard they were gonna make this, and I'm like, so Dakota Johnson's gonna wear like old lady makeup is that what we're doing oh no no so brian this is hollywood we can't ah, yeah. have an old lady ew I no mean, aunt, that's gonna be aunt gross may, yeah aunt ew. may is a smoke show now you know like yeah aunt, aunt may just has to be kind of like a fetus next time mm-hmm. well as we said <laughs> we said giant, giant titty, titty. <laughs> yeah oh fuck so the pearl well, necklace around the nipple you know oh gross <laughs> Gross, dude. Um, I could already tell our our listeners and viewers right now that this is probably going to be a, a dumpster fire of an episode. So it's going to be a weird like one. if you like those, good job. You're going to enjoy this one. Um, if you don't like those, sorry. Uh, well, well, <laughs> I don't Brian, know what to tell you. I, I don't think that there's any better place to start with this episode. I got than- synopsis for it though. Okay. Re- all right. Before you deliver that, like, okay. How and why? How did this movie get made? Why did it get made? I feel like that's going to be the bulk of what we talk about. But yeah, what is, what is the synopsis? Okay, so it? the official synopsis from IMDb, because that's where I'm getting this from, is uh, 
Cassandra Webb is a New York metropolit metropolis New York metropolis. That's such a weird thing. Is a New York metropolis paramedic who begins to demonstrate signs of clairvoyance. Forced to challenge revelations about her past, she needs to safeguard three young women from a deadly adversary who wants them destroyed. Yeah, well, I'm fair. I mean, that's that's fair. But that's it. But if you get into like the details of it, you know, you're not supposed like, to know the details, John. Like if you bake a chocolate cake and you put a turd inside of it on the outside, you're not going to know it has feces in it. You have to you have to start <laughs> pulling the cake apart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that German chocolate frosting really isn't <laughs> that's that shit. OK, Bavarian that is, cream. It's not yeah. Bavarian cream. It is human feces. <laughs> Uh, but but to answer kind of your question, John, after getting that synopsis out of the way, again, for the people who don't know what the fuck we're talking about, I have no clue. I, I really I got I got nothing on why this character and this movie with this director got greenlit. I, I, I don't I almost wish we had our friends from how this got greenlit on to ask him how the fuck did this get greenlit because i i seriously don't know other than just sony had a bucket of marvel shit they had to put out and this fit the bucket it's like those people that are wealthy enough to be able to do this where they throw like a dart at a map and wherever it lands that's where they're gonna vacation i wonder I if they just people yeah <laughs> i wonder if there's just like a hundred spider-man characters on a board and they just close their eyes and threw that dart and it oh it landed on made them web all right we'll make a movie about her do your research interns because i don't understand how you can make a comic book movie with no superheroes in it yeah i don't either and it and not only that john but like it the they have superheroes in it for about 45 seconds total like just, for the whole two hour runtime. For just long 40, enough for 45 the 45 uh, seconds yeah. for the perverts in the back to spank bank it to Sydney Sweeney. I have some thoughts on that whole thing. <laughs> like I got a lot of thoughts. And, and this is from a director who, I mean, I don't, I don't like throwing shade on directors who are new because I get it. But this director, uh, SJ Clarkson had no film narrative film credits to her name. Yeah. Wait, Brian, I thought this movie, she did a lot of TV. By- yeah, she did a lot of TV. She did Defenders, a couple episodes of Defenders. She did Anatomy of a Scandal, uh, Orange is the New Black. So, like, and Jessica Jones. So here, here's my here's my theory, because you asked the question, how did this get made, and why did it get made? So here's my theory. Okay, um, Sony uh, trying to be uh, progressive. Okay decides let's go ahead and get a female director to do a female superhero movie without having to actually like, I don't know, put them on a level playing field and actually make it good. So we'll throw the most bare minimum shit at the movie. Right. And it's like, Oh, well that director, she did a couple episodes, of orange is new black. She did the defenders. She did Jessica Jones. So she knows lady female superhero movies. So why don't we just give her the most, you know, terrible superhero movie with no thought at all on the story and the care of the characters and let's just give her that and like watch it crash and burn well i don't know what the point is of hiring a female director if our main character sucks the entire movie none of the female characters have any unique qualities about them other than teenagers and and there's a there is a scene in this movie where they're learning CPR, but I I couldn't believe that this was a female director because this scene looks like they're humping. I really don't yeah. understand that at all. There, they, it takes the close up shots of each of them learning CPR, and it looks like they're just riding a cock. They're just getting their guts rearranged, and I'm like, this seems like a guy directed this scene. I can't believe a woman directed this. Well, not only that, but I mean, there are a lot of scenes in this outside of that one where it is total like hey how much male gaze can we get in this like i I know specifically the diner scene where they're Mm -hmm. dancing on like a table and 
Sydney Sweeney is doing her, of course, best. Like, you know, hey, I'm going to look look hot and slutty, you know, in a schoolgirl outfit. But, Brian, she has glasses. Okay. I, you, you've, you've pulled me into this, John. <laughs> okay. I have a very serious problem. I don't have anything against Sydney Sweeney. And I have nothing against uh, her characters who are sex positive and that sort of thing. I think that's great. And I think we need more of that. But at the same time, Sydney Sweeney plays a character who I kid you not is dressed in a very, very seductive schoolgirl outfit. And I only say that because I used to work at Party City a long time ago. And the type of outfit she was wearing was very similar to the costumes that we sold. Kinky like, schoolgirl. Yes, yeah. yes. So it's like, let me get this straight. You've got Sydney Sweeney, who, by all accounts, people who are going to see this movie who are perverts are going to see it for her. Um, and you put her in a, a sexy schoolgirl outfit. And on top of that, you also have this this idea that Hollywood is full of pedophiles. So it's like, what 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 the fuck is going on here? Like I'm watching this, I'm just going like, are, are we seriously going to just put this 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 actress in a a, a pedophile's like wet dream? Is that what we're doing? Because that's what it looks like. I don't know, John. What did you think? Oh yeah, they they knew what they were doing, and and that was, it's totally the casting couch thing. Like get get that chick from Euphoria with the big boobs in here, and then we'll yeah we'll schoolgirl her up. But what really drove me insane was that it's twenty eight year olds. Or I would say there's 26 year olds playing 16 year olds, but their lines are like they're six year olds. Like they're like <laughs> the dialogue, they're like little kids, but they're supposed to be teenagers, but they're clearly young adult women. But John, don't you think that all women talk about, you know, the the their their family lives in the woods right outside of New York City? And then say that they got to go get uh, uh, get food because they're hungry and go to the diner that's right outside the woods, outside of New York City. You don't think everyone does that? The four star diner? Yeah. The four star diner. I just everything about this movie just baffles me. I don't even know really know where to start because. John, I fell asleep through this movie. <laughs> OK, I, I l l listener, look, look directly at me at the camera right here. OK. If you're if you're on video, if you're not, OK, you're just hearing me talk to you. I tried really hard. To watch this movie all the way through without passing the fuck out, but I'm going to be honest with you, I passed the fuck out twice. OK, I watched. So I all in all together, I got one complete viewing, but I got it with two half ass viewings because this was so bad and so boring that it caused me to fall asleep while watching it on Netflix. So I'm just sort of saying that in advance. John had the luxury of seeing this thing in the movie theater, which I'm surprised, John, you did not fall asleep. But me, I'm sorry. I fell asleep through this thing because it was so fucking boring. And that may be where, what we're going to start with is how fucking boring. How can you take a superhero movie and just make it uninteresting and just boring? Um, not have any superheroes in it. Uh, yeah. That was a good start. Like, there's um, a TV show on True TV called Impractical Jokers, and it's about mm. you know uh, four buddies, then hidden cameras, and they compete to embarrass each other because they have like earpieces in, and they have to to tell their friend to do something like really outrageous, and if they don't do it, they lose the round. And one of the games they do in that show is like where they pitch a new product, but the other guy has created their product for them, and it's usually something horrible, and then they have to like pitch it and and try to convince people that it's not the worst idea ever and one of the pitches was for um a new video game called superman just the clark kent stuff <laughs> <laughs> so like you basically just have to go around like picking up clark kent's dry cleaning and shit like that you never get to play as superman <laughs> and that's really i feel like this movie is that it's like madam web but but just the non-superhero stuff yeah, it's like, did you ever want to know what your superheroes do on their off hours? Because that's in essence what Madam Web is. You know, oh, your superheroes, they go to a, a uh, baby shower and make it very, very fucking awkward. That's what happens. 
Um, she, but, she sucks, by the way. Can we just mention that? Like, yes. Madam Webb yes. sucks. I'm sorry, Cassandra Webb. She is unbearable. And there is there's a term in screenwriting called save the cat moment, where you put something in the early part of your movie, in the example, saving a cat out of a tree or something, that makes your character likable and makes you want to root for them. She saves, like, this woman uh, as a paramedic. Her and Uncle Ben are paramedics. Ben Parker's in it for some reason. Uh, Listen, if I can't get Spider-Man, I'm going to get Uncle Ben, okay? Adam Scott is, like, the only saving grace in this movie. But, um, but yeah, they save a woman's life. And the doctors come up and are like, I I thought you would want to know that she's going to make it. And, like, Cassandra's just like, who? Like, the person you brought in? Oh, look, here's her kid. She drew you a picture because you... You saved uh, her mom. And she's like, what the fuck do I do? And Ben has to be like, take the picture. And she goes, uh, yeah, whatever, kid. And I'm like, it's the, it's not the save the cat moment. It's the shoot the cat moment. But John, she's jaded because her mom died when she was in the Amazon. Okay. Researching like, spiders. Yeah. Researching spiders. And how dare she research spiders and be pregnant in the Amazon? That's why she's jaded. Um, but he no, you're you're right. In the Amazon researching <laughs> spiders right before she died. But but you're right. She she is the most unlikable protagonist out there. Like every, every time, even her interactions with uh, the other future spider women um, are just annoying. Like she she hates them up until the last like what fifteen minutes or so. Yeah. Yeah, after, well, uh, by the way, uh, for anybody that hasn't seen this movie, thank you for listening to this yeah, thank you. mad Seriously. rant breakdown. But all three of these of these teenage girls, they're, they're all... Teenage is in air quotes, by the way. Yeah, they're all brought together because the villain of this movie, who I guess he's just supposed to look like anti-Spider-Man because like that'll look good in the trailer. You'll th- people will you accidentally think, think Spider-Man's, Spider-Man's in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, he has premonitions of them killing... Uh, of the three of them killing him. So yeah. he tries to like hunt them down. And Madam Webb now has psychic powers because she like drowned in the river or some shit. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so she like kidnaps these kids and she goes, hey, shut up, you little fucks. Just shut the fuck up. I'm going to save your fucking lives. And you're going to go in the woods and you're going to stay there. And I'm going to leave you for a long time in the woods. But just fucking trust me, you fucks. And they go, oh, okay. We trust you implicitly because we read the script. And it's we just, trust you, crazy lady who yeah. abducted us from a train station. And just the, the little mistakes that this movie makes, it's it reminds me like it's say if it, like a 16 year old wrote a script and you had to be like like in a creative writing class and you go, ho ho, little Billy, um, I see what you were trying to do there. But um, like when she she takes a cab, she steals a cab. Uh, in order to like get the kids to safety and then she pulls off the front and back license plate but it's a fucking cab on top of it it has the cab number and on the side of the car so that's what i would tell little 16 year old billy hey nice try little billy but you know they could they could find a cab by uh the top and and the side of it and also any police officer would pull over a car that doesn't have a license plate but nice try little billy yeah, it's almost like they should have uh, stolen a regular car instead of like a cab, you know? Right. Yeah. If like you're whatever. Gonna, if you're gonna pull that shit. Like steal a regular car. Sony probably has a partnership with an automobile, right? Like, <sighs> I mean, Sony has apparently a lot of partnerships that were clearly shown off in this this yep. uh, movie. Brian, when you said the movie was directed by a woman, I was like, oh, I, th- I thought it was directed by a can of Pepsi. I uh, thought it was directed by a can of Pepsi or a PSP. Which and was I'm, not even available in 2004. 2004. 2003 yeah. or 2004? Three, yeah. Okay, yeah, it wasn't even available in 2003. Which I don't... I thought Sony was a subsidiary of Coke. And I guess I'm wrong about that. Because remember when we watched Jack and Jill? That was a Sony picture, right? That was a Sony picture, yeah. And they had Coca-Cola everywhere in that thing. I wonder if they just traded partnerships or something because i'm like i think it was i thought because also in the ghostbusters 2016 remake they 
had them drinking out of uh, just generic cups when they got Papa John's pizza because Papa John's carries Pepsi products and they couldn't show Pepsi because they also had a partnership with Coca-Cola in the movie. So I don't somewhere, some boardroom, they just must have changed soda companies. I don't know. My guess is that Pepsi was like, hey, uh, can we get a crap ton of money and put it in your superhero movie uh, and just have it where everyone who is in the movie is drinking a Pepsi? And it's infuriating because she it's really bad. Well, like, Dakota- I don't I know. I know product placement is going to be in movies. Yeah, I think that as moviegoers, we expect that. But like it is so blatantly like in your face, you almost it almost is like Dakota Johnson is holding a can of Pepsi at the. Uh, like the it's the 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 baby shower, um, yeah. for Peter Parker, and she's holding the can of Pepsi, and it's almost like looking at the camera, looking directly at you, the audience, going, wink, wink, nudge, Pepsi products. Well, see, that drove me absolutely insane because, like, I guess as a way for her to continue to hold the label at the audience, she's like incapable of opening a can of soda. I noticed that too. Yeah, and she's like, as an actress, she just made a choice where she's like, okay, I'm just going to fidget with this can because, like, I guess maybe I'm at this baby shower. I'm uncomfortable. So maybe I'm not, like, focusing enough on, you know, cracking a can open. But this way, I can just hold the label in front of the camera lens the whole time. It's like, just drink the fucking Coke. or Yeah, dr- drink the Coke. Okay. Drink the RC Cola. Drink the RC Cola. Drink the Jolt. God damn it. <laughs> Dakota yeah. Johnson. Um, all right. Well, before we get any further into this, I, I do, I do have as our long running, uh, uh, I'm um, excited for this, our, our long running, uh, segment on this podcast of showing some terrible fucking reviews about this movie from other people aside from ourselves. So I got four, um, three that I pulled from, uh, letterboxd, which is, I love letterbox so much, by the way, <laughs> I'm not even just saying that as someone who like likes to look at reviews. But my God, the reviews on Letterbox are amazing for every movie because you can really find like the worst, the worst. And I got one from Amazon. Uh, no, I not Amazon, but IMDb. So there's like a, a okay one there. But let's take a look at these, John. And you have right. not seen these, right? I have not seen. You have these not seen whatsoever. these. All right. So let's look at the first one here. The first one is what? It, <laughs> what in the Pepsi Cola did I just watch? Was it written by AI? Why were all the villains lines done as ADR? Does CPR cure everything? Why do they make Britney's toxic also a certifiable boop feel so sinister? <laughs> well, the last part of that, it was 2003. So there was only one song that came out in 2003 because, you know, uh, Britney came out with toxic and all the other recording artists went, shit, we got to wait another year. This song's too incredible. It's too so- good. It's the it's only good. song. It's the only song that came out that year. By the way, did you see Blockbuster? Did 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 you see the that she wants to watch American Idol? Did you know it's two thousand three? Did you know? Did you did you know? <laughs> did, did you know? <laughs> did you did you know that things were a little different in two thousand three? Did you know there was a blockbuster video? <laughs> there was a thing you couldn't you had stream to go and buy, or you did- had to go and rent a tape. John, did you know that TVs were square? What? (laughs) What's a catheter tube? (laughs) TVs were square. And then did you know that apparently you watch A Christmas Carol in the middle of fucking July? Yeah, that was... (laughs) Everything is baffling. Who Who the fuck watches A Christmas Carol in the middle of July? Like, I don't know when this movie takes place, but I'm assuming it's got to be the spring or summertime. Yeah. Right? There's no snow. It's New York. It doesn't seem like it's sweltering hot, so maybe it's like May. But still. Yeah, I can understand. I don't mean I don't understand it, but abstractly, I can understand some people that like to do Christmas in July. That makes me want to puke, but I understand some people like if you really love Christmas. like Oh, it's only six months away. But May? What the fuck? Yeah, it made no sense to me. I'm just like, why are you watching A Christmas Carol in the middle of fucking July or May or whatever? Whenever that isn't Christmas. Like if it was snowing, I could be like, all right. Okay, makes sense to me. But no, no. But but uh this person's review, I love how they just immediately went to like the Pepsi bullshit. And it also leads into talking a little bit about the really weird dubbing of the villain in this. 
I I have a I, theory I, on I, that. I did a double take the minute I I saw it the first time. I'm like, do they seriously like ADR this guy's dialogue the whole time? And they did. Not not the whole time. And see, that's almost why have, the whole time. I have a theory on this, and I also have a humongous complaint about this. Okay. And I don't know if I should do it as like. Hey Brian, I have a theory on it. What's wrong with this audio? Is that there seems to be <laughs> another issue of consistency. Um, <laughs> you just but, ruin the audio for our audio only. Users, <laughs> uh, just oh, good jest. But um, I think that when you make a movie like this by committee, yeah. you want to have a lot of. They probably tell the director and the cinematographer get a lot of shots from the back of their head. Get a lot of shots of them in silhouette. Get a lot of shots of them like picking things up with their hand like the second unit like holding things so that we can cut to that shot in case we need to to put in a new piece of dialogue because these movies you know it's not by an auteur who has a script ready to go you know when they make the movie it's not spike lee doing do the right thing this is still being written as it's being shot and then they even re they continue to write it in post-production so what they do is they go, oh, wouldn't it have been great if we had had him say this or the studio's like, this might be confusing. So have him say this to explain something. And so then they just cut to, you know, you hear if you listen very closely, you can hear his onset audio and then he'll turn his head and it'll be completely uh, audio that was done in the sound booth. And they're jarring how different they are from each other, but they they did it so that they could continue to write the movie in post production. But here's my question: How does a Sony movie, does a, a tentpole, you know, superhero movie, how do you not equalize your audio? I would yell at my students if they made that mistake. This is over a hundred million dollar property. Well, not even that, John. I mean, it, it's it's clear to me, at least, that there was a story that had been established at the time of shooting. And just as you said, like, they, they clearly must have changed that story. And obviously, they were like, well, we can't change everything, but we can just change this villain's lines because everyone's reacting to what the villain is doing. So, like, I think they just made his story and his arc much more simplified and stupid um and this is what we get but you're you're right like they they clearly didn't care too much at all about this movie to the point where they didn't even attempt even attempt to to blend in or even match like the mouth movements like i here's the thing too i like i i know from just my day job that there is technology out there that can manipulate your mouth and make it appear like you're saying something after you've recorded it. That mm -hmm. technology exists right now. That's not something that didn't exist when this came out. This existed, you know, like three or four years ago. So if that technology is already there, why could that not have been used here? You're telling me again, John, like, like you said, that Sony doesn't have access to that, that they are like, yeah, sorry, we don't care. That just it all it all breeds to me that no one who actually was putting the money and the vision behind this gave two shits outside of we need to get something out the door that has Marvel and the Spider-Man character in it. And this is it. It's fit our bucket for that time of the year. When do you think they stopped caring? Because it obviously wasn't in the script stage because. You look at something like Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and you find out it's like had eight passes on the script by like seven different writers. You know, if that movie, if they care that much about it, the, you know that they they somebody said looked at the the final script for this movie and went, This is genius. Let's shoot it. And I don't know if it could have happened on set. I just at what point, yeah, did they just they just give up caring because there's too many problems with this movie that could have been to some degree fixed that they just they just didn't care and they just gave up on it well i, I mean I, I really believe that that i think there was i mean i hate to say this i do think there was sexism involved from the standpoint of would you see a male superhero movie go through this level of bullshit i don't think you would 
yeah, you could point to to Mobius or Morbius, wherever the fuck it is. But even that <laughs> one, even that one, you know, as terrible as it is, and it's pretty fucking bad, um, got a second life as being the bad movie. It leaned into it, right? Like it's it more than time. It, yeah, yeah. So like it, it is kind of it's it's done a Tommy was so, if you will, mm-hmm. and become kind of that like yeah, this is the terrible B movie superhero film. But with Madam Web, like even if they thought, oh yeah, we're gonna do that with this one, I don't think they just cared. And I think part of it comes down to like, well, no one gives a shit. It's a female led movie. It's a female led director. Eh, who cares? Eh, we'll write it off. Who cares? Just like with Batgirl. Do you you really right? think that Madam Web was like a tax write off? I no, I don't think it was a tax write off. I think that their ability to give two fucks went out the door when they're just like, well, it's a Madam, it's Madam Web. No one gives two shits. Yeah, we're gonna put it out there. Yeah, we're gonna do this because we maybe there was they were contractually obligated to put out a Marvel film at a certain time, and this is the one they put out. They couldn't do Venom 3. They couldn't do Craven the Hunter. So they're like, well, we'll put out Madam Web. And yeah, we'll put it out of time. Like this came out what in March or February? Mar- March or April, I think. It was it was warmer outside, but there was still a briskness to the air. So I think it might have been late March or early April. No, this came out in February. Oh, did it? Oh. It came out February. Seasonally warm. Okay. So let's let's put this in here. That's okay? right. They picked Valentine's Day. They picked Valentine's it, Day. Because I thought people might want to ironically watch it. Like yes. a couples thing. Like, let's go ironically. Yes. Money. Which I'm sorry. If you take your date to see Madam Web, uh you're 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 not gonna have a second date. <laughs> because any person who, who who is worth their sanity would be like, why does this person hate me? <laughs> to take me to a terrible fucking movie. What did I do? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, I remember there was like two friends I had from the Burrow Bar, um, and I took them to see uh, Quantum of Solace, the second Daniel oh, Craig Bond movie, the worst one of his run. And it like, really is the worst run. <laughs> It was like almost awkward between us for like a week or two. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry I took you to this shit movie, but Casino Royale was good. I thought this would be good too. Fellas, blink if you haven't gotten your Father's Day gift yet. Yeah, we thought so. But today's episode is brought to you by Manscapes, the leader in below the waist grooming. Maybe your pops has had the same bush since the 1970s, and that's okay. But our friends over at Manscaped have crafted the total package for that special day whether it's for the boys downstairs his beard or even the best pair of underwear out there manscape has your bases covered head over to manscape.com and get 20 percent off and free shipping that's what you heard me free shipping with the code cinema 20 from daddy to zaddy trust manscape but hey brian i don't know why yeah. i'm talking about father's day i don't have any i don't, you don't have, have any kids. kids and you got like 30 of them so uh, Shut up. Why don't you, i don't have 30 of them <laughs> why don't you tell everybody a little bit more about why this is the ideal father's day gift all right well let me let me tell you something here okay i i have i have i have four kids okay i have three stepsons and one daughter and as i've gotten older you know the act of shaving and the act of grooming and all that fun stuff uh you know it's it's relaxing to me like it, it really is something where you know i i really enjoy the act of shaving like i work from home so like there are days when i just i'm like i'm not gonna shave so i'll have like a week's build up on my head and then my beard and of course my balls and you know for me you know getting that that you know couple minutes here and there to like really you know clean everything up and look look human is important and, you know, I think more dads need to need to focus on that. And and with that said, I mean, you know, your your dad or or whoever's dad, you know, they might have a beard trimmer that maybe is really old and it's rusted and it needs some tender love and care. And and that's fortunately where, you know, our friends at Manscaped have it covered. Introducing the face shaver, that's a must have for that smooth finish that daddy loves, the Manscaped handyman. Powerful and compact this face shaver isn't just for home use. It's perfect for quick touch-ups on the go. Its precision blades ensure a clean shave every time, making it an essential tool for any dad's grooming kit. If your dad prefers rocking a scruffier beard like myself, you know, I'm not going clean shave on the beard, uh, then the Beard Hedger Pro Kit is the ultimate beard maintenance tool for him. 
This all-in-one kit includes the Beard Hedger, Manscaped's most advanced beard trimmer, along with shampoo, conditioner, oil, and balm for his beard. It also comes with a brush, comb, and scissors so he can style his beard and mustache like a true gentleman, right? You know, you want to look good. With summer just around the corner, the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra is the perfect gift for him. Designed for his hairy daddies in mind, his balls. It features his signature lawnmower 5.0 for all of his grooming needs for his balls. Jesus Christ. While you're upgrading his grooming tools, don't forget about the underwear drawer. That set of underwear that maybe he got in the 19, you know, 90s. They've been sitting around a little bit and maybe they got a hole somewhere in the stretch. And you know what I'm talking about. You know, Manscaped has you covered there, too. And with that said, we've got the Manscaped Boxers 2.0 and they're here to help. The Boxers 2.0 are crafted with a simple mission in mind to be quite literally the most comfortable pair of boxers that you have ever, ever owned. What makes them so special? Their secret jewel pouch. You know what I'm talking about. A dedicated space that cradles your stones in place with a perforated performance fabric for extra breathability. John, have you actually worn the boxers that Manscaped gave us? I actually have. I enjoy them quite a bit because back in the day before Manscape, if I shaved my balls, it looked like Lemony Snicket's head, you know, just random hair everywhere because it was just never comfortable enough to do it. But now that I've got like a Mr. Clean head for my balls, uh, completely smooth, this underwear does help protect that because no matter what type of tool you're using, you know, Manscaped's the best on the market. It's still going to be a little sensitive because they're balls. So having this underwear to really cradle them is extra level nice. 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 Get 20% off and free shipping with the code CINEMA20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with the code CINEMA20. Never forget where you came from, if you know what I mean. Happy Father's Day from Manscaped. You came from your dad's balls when he banged your mom. Yeah, yeah, but man, it just, it was so bad. All right, let's, let's, let's move on to another review. So I got I got three more of these. Oh, yes, right. yes, yes. Yes. Let's see what review number two is. It was fun, bad for the first half and bad, bad for the second. Highlights. Dakota Johnson looking like she's about to edgeable. I don't know what that is. The entire time. Water birth demonstration. Ben Wyatt is still Ben. Hacker Shoshana. Life is strange bird moment. And the the whack ass dubbing. Okay. Whatever like. that is. L- L- low lights. <laughs> Maddie's character being so unbearable that it could inspire misogyny in the most devout feminist on <laughs> earth. Possibly the stupidest elementary school essay ending I have ever witnessed. Two minute flight to Peru, the whack ass dubbing. <laughs> Even your wow. doggy is loving it too. <laughs> it's like I got I got thoughts too. <laughs> yeah. But- this is why you should watch the video version. This is why you should watch the video version. You can, you can see John's dog. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the whack ass dubbing, like another ADR reference oh. uh, there. But yeah, I don't. It's just another thing. Like, I almost feel that we should be going plot point by plot point. But if we did, it would be six hours. We can't. That, that she's like, can't. hey, Ben, these are three kids that I kidnapped. Can you, can they live with you while I fly to Peru? And he just goes, yeah, okay. Sure. Uh, <laughs> do they have any allergies, peanut allergies or anything I should know about? Any of them gluten intolerant? These kids you've kidnapped? Or more like, here are these 28-year-olds who are pretending to be 17-year-olds who are a very attractive. Have fun, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, that's really what I'm just saying. It, I, uh, the whole thing just feels really icky and weird. It just does. I'm sorry. Well, and maybe it's just me projecting, but maybe it's just because I'm getting a vibe from the movie that's just this is just bad. This well, and these yeah, gross these three high school twenty five year olds, like high they, school twenty five year olds that none of them like have parents, but somehow live in New York and go to school and live their lives. Like, are they in foster homes? Like, what the. Well, fr- uh, uh, well, I was going to say, I love the fact that no one's parents gives two shits that these kids have been kidnapped and gone missing. No. Well, I mean, the one yeah. like she's like, my mom's in an insane asylum after my dad left her. And the other one's like, my my mom died when I was a 
I don't know. And the other, I have like, no parents, and yeah. I live in the apartment myself. And the other one's like, my parents are wealth, wealthy assholes, and they live in another country, and I'm just on my own. So it's like, okay. So this like paramedic <laughs> who goes blind just decides I'm gonna adopt. Not that they're ever adopting, but adopt like three 16 or 17 year old girls. There's no judge on the planet wouldn't be like, this is some kind of creepy sex grooming. <laughs> You're not. Uh, well, especially, <laughs> especially the way that, that, that uh, Cassandra Webb looks at the end of it. She looks like a fucking pimp. Mm hmm. <laughs> She looks like she's like she's got these weirdo fucking sunglasses on. She's in a Professor Xavier wheelchair and she's just like, I don't need to see anymore. I'm fine. Everything is fine. I can see the future now. I can tell what Chinese food you've got there. This so, yeah, poo -poo platter. imagine imagine her coming into like uh, a, a custody hearing and going up to the web, going up to the judge, be like, I know that the children will be much better with me because I can see the future because I've got magic spider web powers. They'd say, lock her the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> and a couple of things. She got hit in the face with a firework underwater. And that, yeah, how did her. that, how did that make her a paraplegic? But yeah, but yeah, I was going to lead to that. Like, how, why is she in a wheelchair? And if she's completely black blind. Why does she need the sunglasses at all? I don't know, because people don't want to see her weird, funky eyeballs. You know, it's I imagine it's hard for an actor to have to pretend to be blind. So yeah. it's just like, give me some sunglasses that completely block out my eyes. So I don't have to tr pretend to be blind. I, I guess so. But I, I agree with you. Like it. The movie does not do a good job of saying, like, this is why she's in a wheelchair and this is why she's blind. Like. You know, I go back to like X Men First Class did a very good job of telling us and showing us why Charles Xavier is in a wheelchair. Like, that's one of the most pivotal scenes in the movie. Mm -hmm. And it makes complete sense for the relationship he has with Magneto throughout the entire film that he ultimately is the one who caused him to be, you know, in a wheelchair. So, I mean, it makes sense for that. And you're given kind of a very clear explanation of it. Um, they kind of get a little muddy down the road when we get to uh, X-Men Apocalypse to explain how he goes bald. Won't hold that then, then personally on that one. But just saying, like, for that first movie, it, it gives us that this is how the character became the character really succinctly. Mm -hmm. This one, Fireworks Factory Explosion. That's it. <laughs> and how? Wait. So, I'm sorry. This is great. Your brain's audio. hurting. Your brain's yeah, hurting you. Isn't me it? just deeply sighing into the microphone. Sorry, everybody. But just if this is supposed to be 2003, and Ben Parker's sister is pregnant. Well, it's not his sister. It's his sister-in-law. Or, yeah, but that's supposed to be Peter, right? Yeah, it's it's Peter Parker. Maybe who's, Peter. Who's, it's baby Peter, yes. But in these movies, he's supposed to be like 18, but that would make him 21. Yeah. Does anybody care? But also, isn't it kind of important for Spider-Man to be the first quote unquote Spider-Man because he's Spider-Man? That's yeah. So if there's apparently when he got his spider powers, there were already spider women. And where they're where not they Spider been? Women yet, John? Okay, they're not Spider Women yet. They're gonna become Spider Women, but you're right. The timing doesn't match up because if they're maybe what five years removed from being Spider People, then what's the point of Spider Man being the first Spider Man? Because he's got yeah, as you said, like eighteen years. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make it's, sense. I just don't understand why the words "why" and "how" weren't used three hundred times in the script read. I, again, I go back to this was the the lowest hanging fruit, and I think there was I think there was an element of sexism involved, um, about just not giving two shits about this character, not giving two shits about the story, the direction, all of it. It just it you, you can't treat a movie this badly if you care, and clearly no one cared. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's just kind of where my thought process is. Um, all right, let's jump to review number three. All right. All right. This movie is filled with funny, hot garbage, but <laughs> there was one thing that couldn't make me stop laughing. Because Sony made this, there is obvious product placement. We see an extra plane on his PSP. The movie really wants you to know that it takes place during 2003. Like, really, really bad. The PSP came out in 2005. Sony forgot when their own product came out. That's fucking hilarious. Yeah, and that, and that's true because I, I could have told them when it came out because I remember I was... um just beginning my sophomore year in college mm -hmm. and this one kid like we were on break in my uh 2d art class and this kid had a psp and we all just kind of like gathered around him like ooh ah look at it oh it's so pretty you know because like you've never seen a portable gaming system that had that kind of graphics and everything uh up to that point so yeah i could have told them when it came out because i could track it to when i was in college if I can remember, you think the Sony executives could? I mean, I'm not surprised. I think with a lot of these large companies, they're so siloed. And and think about how much turnover was there. Um, so, like, you know, it's it's very possible that maybe they were like, yeah, we don't know when the Sony PSP came out. You know, maybe Google our internal. It. You could Google that shit. Yeah. But. I, I, I don't think, again, I go back to this. They didn't care, John. None of them cared. No one who at Sony gave two shits about this movie. Um, you know, think about it. It came out on Valentine's Day. Is there ever any good movie that comes out on Valentine's Day outside of Dracula from 1931? That's one. <laughs> See, I could understand it if it was like some romance comedy you know, uh, with like back in the day, like Meg Ryan, you know, or, or, you know, something like that, or, you know, who, like Kate Hudson, you know, or whoever the, the new Kate Hudson is, I'm old, you know, if it's a romance movie, I could see like that coming out on Valentine's day. Cause you know, you want to get your girl all horned up and you might be able to rearrange her guts in the back of your mom's, you know, 2016 Honda civic, but it's very, it's, it's very, um, specific, John. <laughs> <laughs> just saying like that sounds like you've had a little little experience hey i was married in 2016 and uh, my mom <laughs> never owned a honda civic so <laughs> fair enough yeah <laughs> but yeah uh, but for this movie like i said i i do think it was like hey babe let's all go ironically let's get high and go ironically watch madam web like they knew they had a turd on their hands so they were trying to get people to go ironically watch it and I mean, they I, made a turd. They knew it. They, they, they made a turd. They knew they were making a turd. And I'm so sorry, Craven. Like, you're doomed no matter what. Really even are. if even if it's decent, like, after Morbius and this movie, you're dead on arrival, pal. You're screwed. Yeah. No, you're not wrong. Um, and the same goes for Venom 3, you know? Like, that. Mm. Those movies are fucking tough. Both... Venom 1 and Venom 2 in their years um, ended up on my top 10 worst movies of the years list, but they still made a quadrillion bazillion dollars. So I imagine Venom 3 will suck, but I do think that it's going to be bulletproof from the other Marvel movies for some reason. Just like the Jurassic World franchise, it doesn't matter how bad they are. They still make a quadrillion bazillion dollars. I put that on Tom Hardy and the funny moments within the venom series i really think that i think those couple pieces here and there are what keeps this thing going if they lost that it'd be dead like 100 percent dead well, i think it's just venom i think people love a good anti-hero you know like, yeah yeah it's got that wolverine kind of vibes you know like is he like good is he bad and yeah uh and ask todd mcfarland and he'll say hi i'm todd i created venom uh mcfarland <laughs> remember me <laughs> uh all right let's get to our last review this one's a yeah. this one's a wordy one this is oh 50 shades of mess <laughs> it's astonishing to think 
that Sony could put out a worse product than 2022's Morbius. But boy, Madam Web manages it. It is embarrassing. It is an embarrassing mess. Talented stars wasted on probably one of the worst comic book movies ever, which nobody asked for. Filled with atrocious dialogue, awkward editing, and laughable structure, it's a clunky, poorly written, messy, and sloppy movie packed with some mediocre editing and performance. The concept is interesting on paper, but it couldn't be saved due to its terrible execution. Madame Webb simply lacked the spark it needed in nearly every department. There is simply nothing memorable in this movie, except maybe some superhero costumes, but that didn't doesn't redeem the fact this movie is bad. So yeah, Madam Web is yet another disappointing entry into Sony's spiderless universe. It's like a love letter to an era of superhero mo- films that people largely want to forget. The Pepsi ads are standout. It falls short of what could have been a decent movie in the hands of someone else 20 years ago. Damn. Bravo. Bravo. I think think you. Yeah. I think that succinctly puts it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this does feel like a movie, honestly, John, that would be popular 20 years ago. Like around like like Daredevil and Catwoman, that type of. Yes. Yes. This feels like it would fit those types of movies where there was no substance where this was before the MCU. Um, So like we didn't know, you know, that you could have good superhero films. Um, Now that's want to preface this by saying this is the, the good, like phase one, phase two, phase three MCU films. Okay. I'm not talking about the new ones because clearly those have sucked ass, but you know, before you you had Iron Man and Captain America and those movies like this feels like one of those movies that that was in that it, the intervening years before between like Batman Begins coming out and the Spider-Man movies. Like you had those couple years here and there where it's just like, yeah, these are really terrible and I don't know why we keep watching them. Every like studio Electra, every those property. Ones. Yeah. Ghost Rider. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's saved by having Nick Cage in it. Nick I Cage mean, saves everything. You could have Nick Cage taking a dump for two hours and people would still go to watch it. Just Ooh. because you want to see like what his what faces he's gonna make. Like a like an Andy Warhol type movie. <laughs> Three hours of Nick Cage taking Oh my god, shit. could you imagine if, if Andy Warhol was alive and had Nick Cage at his disposal? Like, can you imagine? Like, I could imagine that if Andy Warhol had Nick Cage, he would do like Andy Warhol's The Mummy with Nick Cage as the mummy. (laughs) And all he does is just eat peanut butter off his belly for 19 hours. He'd be like, oh, I'm a mummy. I'm Imhotep. I've been (laughs) lost in the the thing forever. (laughs) Imhotep. Yeah. Fuck man, just ruined my voice there for the podcast. <laughs> I I do this for you all, by the way. Just want you to know this. I, I well, destroyed my voice for you all. But Brian, you had mentioned, you know, like the underlying sexism in this movie. Can we also discuss how it portrays people in the who live in the Amazon? Oh my God, yeah, they're superhero jungle people until superhero, they're not. Well, they're superhero jungle people who all seem to have gone to the same tailor as peter parker in the future yeah well first, like their like, costumes all look like spider-man at the beginning of the movie when it's cassandra webb's mom pregnant with her like they have to take her to this healing body of water i don't know don't ask but um it's the same to- body of water that thor had his vision in yeah <laughs> And but they're like they're dressed in like the most stereotypically racist like uh Amazonian garb, you know, that like white people would think people in the Amazon wear. But then years later, when Cassandra visits the Amazon, the same guy who saved her when she was in the womb is just dressed in like street clothes. They ran out of money. That's just weird, <laughs> though. Yeah. Well, you know? it, it's it's weird because like 
again, one, like their 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 costumes in the beginning are are literally vines that yeah. are in the shape of Peter Parker's Spider Man costume. Like I'm not even kidding you when I say that. They literally look like the Spider Man costume with the webbing and everything. Um and then yeah, like it's almost like they ran out of money. What I also find hilarious about the the Peruvian rainforest trip uh, is just that it takes place anyway, because literally no time has passed, and that's that's a problem that I have with this movie as a whole is that it doesn't understand like the concept of time within this movie. Like like there is moments where they're in New York City. They're escaping New York City, and then they end up in the fucking woods somewhere. Yeah. Okay? And then they end up, and it's it's not like the woods in New York, because I've driven through New York, and maybe I've missed missed the places, you know, that have the heavy wooded areas. But, like, if they went outside, you know, outside the outskirts to the wooded areas of New York City, you know, time would have passed a bit, so maybe it'd be nighttime. By the time they arrive there, Brian, like, they went through the Holland Tunnel to Jersey. Well, let, let's just <laughs> let's just say, for all intents and purposes, that they ended up in the Catskills. Okay, okay, <laughs> that's let's just that's say they not went a there. Short trip, yeah. That's but. what I'm saying. It's not a short trip. You'd end up. It would take a while to get there. You might not get there until it's nighttime. So, like, there's that. And then it's she's immediately then jumping back to New York City to go to her apartment to stare at her mom's notes that she's had that basically clearly say, oh, yes, the spider people are real and the spider shit's real and all this shit's real. And, oh, yeah, here's the villain who's been chasing you, which, again, I go like, you never read that before? You did? Well, she always seemed jaded against her mom, but but it also gives her an opportunity to just mouth exposition to no one, i.e. us, the audience. Yeah. Yes, yeah. there's a lot of that. And even, like, I... But you've just kind of finishing my point there, you know, then she just says, I'm going to go to Peru. And she's just gone for like a day. And she just she's gone for a day. And then comes back. Hey, you know, great movies also have timing issues. Like, I don't know anybody that agrees with how long Luke was in Dagobah. So that's even true. good movies <laughs> that's Timing true yeah. but i would come back and say that uh luke being in dagobah is within a universe that is an earth yeah fair and doesn't have you know some sort of relatable distance between one place or another you know so like that's that's where i would always come back to is that that is a complete fantasy world and pl- setting so the rules governing, you know, time really kind of go out the window. Um, but you're right. Okay. But I'm just saying it's really bad on this one. That's oh, all it's I'm horrendous. saying. It's really yeah. bad. Yeah. Um, but out, outside of that, um, I did want to talk about the very awkward. What, so many issues I have with this movie. Um, <laughs> The really awkward uh, baby shower. I mentioned this before. So Cassie doesn't want to go to the baby shower for reasons. And don't. And she make, doesn't. Make a but, sickness. Yeah. Yeah. Make a sickness. So instead, what we get is we get this very weird scene, which I don't know why it's in the movie. I really don't. Other than just to say, like, oh, yeah, see, she has powers. But, like, Cassie is at this baby shower name game thing where she has to like write down a memory of her mom. So like, it's already set up to like make her awkward and make her be like, that's a downer. Like she's the Debbie downer of the baby shower. Yeah. And you don't have to be that person. Like, Oh, no. most people don't know her. It's just lie. Lie. Yes. Because you just say, like, ah, my mom made a great apple pie. And they go, ah, oh, that's nice. Next person. You know, she made it, really good peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But, like, she decides that she's going to be the person who doesn't put anything down. Why? Because she knows that someone's going to read that and go, why didn't she put anything down, Cassie? Well, it's because my mom's fucking dead. Yeah, she died in the Amazon. She was pregnant with me researching spiders. 
It's me, it's me, it's me, it's me, spider. My mom. How dare she go to the Amazon when there's no hospital around and she died having me? And she's so irresponsible. By the way, you find out later in the movie she went to the Amazon because Cassie was going to have some weird degenerative disease when she was born. So really, she cared so much about Cassie to devote her life to finding the spider to cure her. I think she did have it. I mean, if you watch Dakota Johnson's performance. Oh, my God. <laughs> She can't open a can of soda. She <laughs> taps it a couple times. Do you know what I'm saying? She's just like, I'm going to take it. I'm going to tap it. I'm going to play with it. And I'm going to like I don't show off. Do you tap their soda? Yeah, some people tap their soda before they open it. Like, what do you what But do you she doing? doesn't even open it. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Like, this, this woman doesn't even open the fucking soda. She just taps it, plays with it, you know, spins it around, does tiddlywinks with it, and then shows it to the audience and then goes, oh, I'm not going to drink it. See, Brian, this is how I know that you're from California. Because you I say, say soda? Yeah, I, I do, too. But I'm I'm Northwestern PA. But yeah, everybody around here is it's pop. But oh, yeah. No, I, I've always been that person. I either go soda or do I do Coke. Coke is a catch all for all. sodas. oh, like the Southerners a little bit. And it's just I, I, I'll use Coke as a catch all for honestly, any sort of dark cola, you know, outside of Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper, I'm going to call it Dr. Pepper. The agnostic soda. It's yeah. not root beer. It's not soda. It's Dr. Pepper. <laughs> That's a South Park reference. It's fucking good. It's yeah. fucking good. I don't care what anyone says. Um, but but yeah, I mean, that that's just that's just me. Sometimes I say soda. I mean, I, I always say soda. I will never, ever, ever say pop. Um, sorry to my fellow Pittsburgh people. You'll never <laughs> catch me saying pop. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, this this movie was terrible, John. Well, see, there's really bad. And there's a there's a saying. Um, and let me make sure I get this right. Um, that every action in the screenplay that there's a there's a specific term for it, but I can't recall it, so I don't want to fuck it up. But something should naturally lead into the next section. Like everything should play off of it in a, in a good written screenplay and not just it seems like there's just something forced in because you didn't write anything in until now kind of thing but this movie relies on a character who can see the future so it's just told here's the next thing that's going to happen not because it happened organically in the screenplay but because we told you that it was going to happen and she already knows it's going to happen and that is just that is inexcusably bad screenwriting at its core. Like all the other issues aside, that's bad screenwriting. This movie to me boils down to one scene. You want to know how bad this movie is. I, I'm, what I'm going to describe to you is a scene where I knew at this point that this movie is in irredeemable and <laughs> just needs to be lit on fire. Um, so there's a scene roughly, I'd say about half, I think about, about halfway through the movie where Cassie is again, reading her, her mommy's journals about spiders and is discovering that e Ezekiel Sims is the bad guy and that uh, he also knew her mom. And she reads, I kid you not when I tell you this, dear listener and viewer, she reads that. Apparently, the spider can give people superpowers to climb on walls. And so what Cassie decides to do is in that moment, get the bright idea to try to climb on walls. And she falls down because she's fucking stupid. Like, John, the minute I saw that, I'm just like, fuck this movie so much. I mean, it was. And that's good. when I knew. That's when I knew. I knew at that moment, every person involved in this movie didn't give two fucks about it. It was their their last ditch chance at a real Heidi Ho Marvel type moment. But no, no. For no. me, here's where here's where the movie lost. All me. right, where, where the movie lose you? Because that was what lost me. So our our villain is like, I had this dream about these uh, three girls in masks. And she's like, hey, it's 2003. 
random ass woman who hasn't been introduced yet you're a super duper computer technology wizard right and she's like yeah of course it's in the script and he goes okay cool what i'm gonna need you to do is i'm gonna describe three women who are in masks and then you're gonna somehow recreate them digitally and then using this 2003 technology based on these people that you've recreated digitally we're going to match them to actual people and then these three people are going to be in the exact same place at once for convenience purposes so you can go kill them all at the same place at the same time what the what the flying fuck <laughs> again nice try billy good script billy good job but that doesn't work billy <laughs> oh john Ah, uh, yeah, that part was bad. I was like, how how is he able to describe what these people look like from and a she, dream? And she, and complete, she recreates them? Yeah, she recreates them perfectly. Like, not even like they don't even like look fake. Like the like 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 just you know, like you you see like a uh, a sketch artist try to sketch someone from a description, and it always like once they actually find the person. And you show them on screen. They never quite look exactly like the sketch, but like, this person apparently is the savant of sketch artists because she's able to completely recreate them at what they look like at 17. Like that's the kicker here. This isn't like saying, Hey, yeah, create them what they look like right now. It's like age them down to 17. And by the way, use the NSA's creepy computer, which Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We could say, hey, this thing really existed um, to get the the zinger in of, haha. remember Patriot Act? This is it. Um, and have that supercomputer be like, yes, we can find everybody, which it never did that. It's 2003. It's 2003. Well. You know, I know that any time a movie comes out, we like to pretend that the technology you know, in a fictional world is super advanced and super knowledgeable. So this movie came out in 2003. People might be like, oh, I bet like the rich people or government have computers like that. But now that it is 21 years later, we know that technology was a joke. I mean, you know, not as bad as it was in 93, but it's still a joke. Like there is no way there is no way that any of this makes any sense whatsoever for 2003. I mean, DVDs were novel. DVDs were novel. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I really hate this movie. <laughs> I'm just, I really, you know, what I hope from this movie is that we get a long form documentary on the making of this movie because I have, <laughs> I have a thousand questions. I, I just want to know how things got through the script process. I want to know how things got through the filming process, how things got through the, the editing process. I want somebody to admit that they lied with their marketing. It's like, oh, look, it's a superhero movie. And the entire time you're going to see Sydney Sweeney in a cat suit, you perverts. So come see the movie. And it's like, that's not the movie. It's a dream oh, sequence well, and, a, and a scene at the end. Yeah. Yeah, and I I think it, like I I I really do think that the the sexualization of the spider women played a big role in this because even think about it like the joke was oh yeah I get the Dune popcorn bucket and then go see Madam Web <laughs> like that was the joke that's the joke there you're gonna go and uh, fillet yourself with a popcorn bucket while watching Madam Web. <laughs> For for our our audio listeners, John literally was o facing. <laughs> spice, <laughs> the spice in your pants, <laughs> the spice melange. <laughs> oh God, yeah, but like I I I think John, you should make the documentary about my Madam Web. <laughs> if I could get everybody to agree to talk to me, I would be so down. I don't think Dakota Johnson ever wants to hear the words Madam Webb ever again. She fired her casting like agency. Like she I get it. fired them over this. I mean, I guess I could understand on paper. You you need as a casting agent, you need to know more of the differences between comic book movies. But I can understand on paper 
her casting agent being like, oh, well, it's a comic book movie and you're the lead. You know, everybody wants to be in a comic book movie. Wow. You know, but they should have realized after the fi- they could have just done the research to realize, oh, there was a failure of Morbius uh, and the Venom movies are not great. They make a lot of money, but they're not good. Like we should maybe just tell Dakota to take a pass on this one. But I think they just did surface level where they went, hey, it's a comic book movie and you're the lead. You know, here you go. This is going to. Well, I think it's also like you dangle the Hey, this is this is by Marvel right yeah. now. Now, it's not Marvel Studios. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's it's not them. But if you say like, well, it's a Marvel movie. But it's, it's not really a Marvel movie. Um, you know, I think like I think certain actors, they feel like, oh, if I get the Marvel film then I'll be the next Robert Downey Jr. or I'll be the next Scarlett Johansson or I'll be the next, you know, uh, Chris Hemsworth. I'll ge- be in well, the, hell, the, the club. You know? Hell, I mean, even like Jeremy Renner, like let's, yeah. I, I don't mean to be rude, but probably the least important of the Avengers team, but I guarantee his his bank account is 90% Marvel movies. Oh, yeah. I mean, granted, granted, he's, he's obviously moved on from that and done things yeah. like, mayor of Kingstown and, and many other projects, but, but you're right. I mean, there is something alluring about getting into the Marvel cinematic universe and getting that sweet, sweet Marvel money uh, and getting on a massive project. So I can understand where Dakota Johnson would be like, well, I did the whole, like, you know, BDSM uh, for, for boomers movies. So <laughs> I probably should now pivot to something more commercial and you know what a marvel movie comes around didn't really look said oh i'm the lead i'm the one that's one of the important has spider it's in the spider-man universe probably thought okay that's a cool idea um but clearly and i really go back to i really believe that sony did not give two fucks about this movie i really think it was like we have bucket a that we need to fill we need a female-led film to come out on Valentine's Day. Why not it? And we have these Spider-Man characters. Let's just do Madam Web. Like Sony, prove me wrong. <laughs> Contact us at the Cinema Psycho Show dot com. I just I, I <laughs> still, tell me I'm wrong. I still can't believe that a studio would throw that much money at a movie that has this much issues. Like and like they don't care they they still want to be profitable unless like you said this is one giant tax write-off scam i don't even think it's a tax write-off. i think it's a bucket i think that's what it is i think they had a content bucket for february of 2024 and they're thinking of themselves well we'll just kind of lean into the female superhero movie uh, but being as it's a female superhero movie, we're not going to give any sort of real talent or thought process to it because let's be honest here, that unfortunately still is reserved for the male led ones. You know, I hate to say that. Um, and I think that there can be a really good female superhero movie out there. Um, unfortunately, the, the studios don't give a fuck. And, like, and, and, and again, it all reads in how they gave Sydney Sweeney a costume that is, I keep going back to this, but that is the dead ringer for me that this movie was made by men who are just trying to milk this thing for barely any they can get, you know, well, They'll milk the perverts, yeah. you know, on top of that, she's like a naive girl with daddy issues who will do anything you tell her. So that's like the perverts are like, hell yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I, I, I'm just telling you, I, I really believe that they they did not care any bit at all for this movie and and probably lied to their actors and lied to their creative talent on there, making them think they were making something great because clearly there was no real push for it. You know, I know there was marketing for it, but like if anything, the minute, you know, the movie's coming out in February and it's a superhero movie. Not a good plan. It's not good. It's not good. So, yeah, I, this was painful to watch. Like, it was really painful. And, like, for me, falling asleep through it twice, that's really bad. 
But weirdly, I could see myself revisiting this movie like drunk or high and laughing <laughs> like like Batman and Robin, you know, like just an utter train wreck or Catwoman, but in a way that I could never watch Morbius again. Just yeah, it to the other so, Spider-Man. So what you're universe. saying is that your hope is that within five years time that Madame Webb will be the cult superhero film the midnight screening of madam Webb. it'll be in the a, 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 along with other superhero terrible films such as blank man and the guyver you, you know what it is like you uh, know what blank man is don't you oh yeah what okay good. yes oh brian we're the same age man okay i know <laughs> i just I, I have to check yeah i have to check but you know how like everybody throws spoons at the screen for the yes. room. I can see everybody throwing Throw like their Britney Spears uh, toxic <laughs> albums at the screen. No, at yeah. certain Empty points Pepsi in the movie. Cans. Oh, dude, you should talk to Row House and see if they could do a screen of Madam Web, but it's interactive where you just you crack open a Pepsi every time that a Pepsi shows up on screen. Well, here's the here's the awkward <laughs> part. Uh, we we have a partnership with Coke. Oh, <laughs> that is awkward. That's where you you say, "All right, everyone, bring in your Pepsi products." See, that's why we got to screen Mac and me. Ah, uh, <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Oh shit! Well, this was a good talk about a <sighs> fucking terrible movie that I never want to see again. Um, with that said, John, where can they find you at on the internet? I don't know. I don't even know who I am anymore. I uh after watching this movie again again I've seen this thing twice the fuck is wrong with me uh but you can find me uh, at Instagram and Facebook um I am technically on like like Goodreads and Letterbox but I suck at social media I just need to get wealthy so somebody does my social media for me I just like tell this is my review of that movie go put it on Letterbox you know but um so I am technically on those things with their ghost towns. and But most importantly, you can find me at J Duds Video Nasties. I think I had mentioned that I was working on a check-in on the movie Manhattan with Woody Allen. But because it is Pride Month, I've shelved that one. Smart move. And I'll be talking about the Kevin Klein, 1997 Kevin Klein movie In and Out and Robin Williams' The Birdcage for Pride Month. Oh, those are good ones. Really good ones. I, I like In and Out like that one for what it was it's very it's then. very funny i mean i have i have a lot of things to explore in it um but this i think it's more hopelessly optimistic for 1997 on, that, on yeah. gay rights than anything yes. that's kind of what i want to approach but yeah no but it's very funny it's funny it's funny um with that said uh you can do me a favor you do me a favor if you're listening to me, look, listen look at me uh do me a favor if you like this episode you like what we do here you like our podcast tell a friend like seriously you're listening to us while you're jogging or if you're you're watching us on youtube go ahead and just share this with a friend who maybe might like a movie podcast um about what we talk about all right do that uh, on top of that i did want to make a little announcement here that i have a survey for you the audience um i am I am always trying to improve upon this podcast, and I really want to hear from you all. So in the description of this episode, there is a link to our audience survey. Um, please fill it out. Let us know what types of episodes you want us to cover. Let us know what things you like, what things you don't like, what things you want to see. And I seriously read through those, and I, I, I want to know what we can do to improve the podcast. So please fill out the audience survey. It's in the link. On top of that, Feel free to reach out to us uh, and follow the show uh, on YouTube. Uh, just click the like, like, click the subscribe, click the follow, all the fun stuff. And if you're on a podcast platform, you can, of course, go to cinemapsychoshow.com forward slash follow and follow us on whatever podcast platform you listen to. The links are all right there. And with that said, we will see you next time. Tally ho. <laughs> <laughs>